Well, another great box lunch talk crowd, huh? This is give yourselves a hand, really, that's okay. Thanks so much. I, you know, I, I think you would be interested to know that I visited um, in my in my my training my self training program. I visited the Frederick County Historical Society not too long ago, and do you know that they they have a similar program? They get maybe ten people. Think about that. This is a real coup for for this and for you and the society and the programming that we put on at these things. And I I just I applaud you. I I salute you for supporting this. Thank you. We have just a few, a few announcements. Um, as you know, we have uh, copies of our, of our history journal, which uh, came out not too long ago. The, the most recent copy are available for $2. And I think uh, Marilyn uh, Phillips has those up at the, uh, at the desk where you registered. Uh, $2 each. And I, it's always fascinating history. We have some great authors who, uh, who, who pen those. Uh, I know I enjoy them. The um, upcoming events, we have in order of, in chronological order, we have Antiques Appraisal Day. Uh, here's our rack card. It's also available for takeaway. It's uh, Saturday, September 14, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., right here. We're, we're still seeking patrons and advertisers for our program, so if anyone would like to continue to support that, that, uh, that cause, that would be great. It is our biggest fundraiser of every year, so it's very important that we do well with it. Um, we have our trip, bus trip to Harrisburg on September 18th, just four days after Antiques Appraisal Day. Be sure to pick up the blue card and, and uh, register for that. And then our journey to Fredericksburg, a yellow card up front, on Wednesday, October 16th. And I know those will be really popular. Our box lunch talks, of course, are, are in the uh, yellow, or pink folder. I'm colorblind. Um, and the next one coming up will be... Um, on uh, October the 8th, is that right? No, sorry, September the 10th, Sykesville on the Patapsico. That'll be here again on that date. And then on Tuesday, October 8th, the Elderdice family of Westminster. Uh, and I know Jim Leitner in particular is uh, excited about that because he'll be our speaker that day. Um, on Tuesday, November 12th, uh, Sam Brainerd will be, uh, Sam, why don't you raise your hand there? Good. And, and Jim Leitner, raise your hand too. Okay, there he is, right over there. Um, Sam will be doing our program on November 12th, and that's early radio in Carroll County. That should be really fascinating. And then, on, and then to close out 2013, on Tuesday, December 10th, it's Wines of Central Maryland. I know we'll like that. Past, present, and future. So I think you'll really enjoy that. Uh, Al Spoler of WYPR, who does that uh, great show with Hugh Sisson, my old McDonough classmate, uh, will be uh, doing uh, uh, his seller notes thing with us that day. So that'll be really fascinating. Um, I also want to thank uh, New Windsor State Bank, Tom Rasmussen, president of the bank, is here. Tom, where are you? There he is back there. Tom is our sponsor for these box lunch talks throughout the year. I should say New Windsor State Bank, but Tom, we really appreciate the support. I also want to thank the Community Media Center. Eric is back here filming today. They do about four or five of these a year now, and it's uh, always something you can tune into online to catch an old program or a future program after it's filmed. Uh, and I also finally want to thank the program committee. Uh, Marilyn Phillips is back there uh, and, and all of her volunteers. And let's give them a nice round of applause. They do a great job, and they're so committed to this. I also, actually, I, one thing, uh, on Antiques Appraisal Day on the 14th, we could really use some afternoon volunteers here again at the American Legion from 1 to 4.30. So if you, if you think you can volunteer, just let me know or let, uh, let any of our staff know or give us a call at the Society and we'd love to, to take you down and uh, take your name down and, and work with you that day. Okay, without further ado, let me introduce our, our terrific speaker today and his great program. Uh, Sam Piazza is a, a member of our board of directors. He's actually a, a vice, vice chairman. And uh, he's a graduate of Loyola College and the University of Baltimore Law School. He was admitted to the Maryland Bar in 1987. He practiced law with several firms in, in Baltimore for 17 years. And since 2005, he served in the office of the Maryland Attorney General. Sam moved to Carroll County in 1994 and soon became fascinated by the role uh, the county played in the Civil War. 
He chose Maggie Maring as the subject of the thesis for which he was awarded his master's degree in historical studies from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County uh, in 2008. Well, without further ado, I think uh, we'll bring up Sam, and, and I know you're going to enjoy this program. Let's give him a nice round. Thank you, Fred. Um, can everyone hear me? Good. Um, I speak loud anyway, so you should be able to hear me. Um, as, as Fred said, I, I am an attorney, but please don't hold that against me. Um, in 2003, uh, I decided to go back to school to get my master's in historical studies at uh, UMBC because I always had an interest in history. And uh, of course, one of the first things you have to uh, do is try to pick a thesis. Uh, and I, I did this on a, uh, basically one course a semester, so I didn't graduate in 2008. So I had some time. But I was a member of the, of the Historical Society even then, and I saw Margaret Maring's name pop up in one of the brochures for the yearly Civil War seminar. And I said, boy, and I just had a child recently, and I want to do something about children. So I picked Margaret Maring as, as my topic, not knowing whether or not there was anything really out there <laughs> except for a diary that she wrote. Um, First thing I want to just go through is just a process for those who've never gone through the process of trying to find out information and research on somebody, and in particular about Margaret Maring. Um, this almost is if you're a history detective when you do these type of things. Things uh, it's both rewarding and frustrating at the same time. So what what, um, what I did is I I got a copy of the diary and uh, I read through it. I said, well, that's great, but uh, I needed more than that for my thesis because I just couldn't just write a thesis about the diary. So I, I, I went to the Maryland Historical Society where the original diary was, and I, was, I went through that. And then, I, of luck, of all lucks, she wrote a book uh, in 1910 uh, called 77 Days Abroad, and uh, a self-published book about her trip to uh, Europe, but she also talked about her uh, religion. She talked about Abraham Lincoln. Uh, she talked about her support of the Women's Christian Temperance Union and suffrage. And as I said, that was luck, um, because I had no uh, expectation of finding anything else she had written other than that. And then once I found that, I, was, I contacted the uh, dub, Women's Christian Temperance Union in, in Illinois, where their national office is. Unfortunately, when I contacted them, uh, they were on the brink of basically going out of business for the most part. Now, they've, they've come back since then. Uh, but they, they were on the brink at the time. But I was able to get a researcher to help me out, and they sent to UMBC a number of uh, microfiche uh, or microfilm uh, to me, volume of, volume of microfilm. Uh, which I went through every single one of them, trying to just find her name somewhere. And, and by going through every single one of them, I was able to find her name and that she had attended a number of uh, conferences over time. So that was another piece of the puzzle I was able to uh, find at that point. Um, and then I, the historical society here through the newspapers, I looked through every single one of them. Unfortunately, they're not searchable, uh, like the New York Times or the Baltimore Sun. So you actually have to read through every single one of them. Now, after a while, you know, I skipped all the advertisements. Um, and I was able to pin down where in parts of the newspaper information would be. But even then, I did miss something. And recently, some, uh, one of the uh, members of the Historical Society found something with her name in it and about her, an obituary on her. So even then, you miss things. Um, you know, people sometimes think that this is like when my kids used to have a, see a cartoon. It was, it was called the big, uh, great big book of everything. You just open the book and you find the answers to everything. Well, that's not how this works, uh, obviously. Uh, I mean, you just take little pieces of the puzzle and you try to put them all together. And in my opinion, the puzzle of Margaret Marion has not been completed yet. I know there's more information out there. Uh, it would be great if I could fly to Illinois and uh, go through their records. Uh, because unfortunately they have one person there, and I think she's volu a volunteer, and she's been very nice about this, but uh, it'd be nice if I could sit there and f go through all the records and try to find more about Margaret Mary. And in the, in the long run, I think I will, because there's always information out there. I don't know if you recall this, but in 2002, they found a trunk of General Lee's trunk uh, in a bank in a basement. Um, and in that trunk were 4,000 letters uh, and photographs about General Lee. Now, who would think that you'd find that in 2002 after all those years? But uh, 
the story is uh, her daughter had died and it was left in the basement. And one day they said, well, what's that trunk? <laughs> and they opened up, it was General Lee. So, uh, I mean, that's the kind of things you just find. And that's, that's once again, that's luck. But a lot of this is just a lot of hard work to get to uh, where you're going. Um, today, what I'm going to do is discuss, and this is my, this is my thesis I wrote um, when I was at UMBC about Margaret Marion. And it talks about uh, not only the diary of the Civil War, but, but how that and her religion and the, her personal tragedy was a motivating factor in her becoming a, uh, a leader in both the temperance and the suffrage uh, movements of the 19th and early 20th century. And at the end, I'm, please ask questions uh, and about this pro subject, if you have any questions or you have any comments about it. Oops. Oh, there we go. Um, Margaret Mary, there it was a it, it was a would be a large family for now uh, for these days, but uh, back then, um, typically, the average family had seven children. Um, uh, but in this case, there were nine children. In this uh, in this case, now this Elizabeth Marshall Mary, her mother, uh, was born was born in uh, Pennsylvania, um, but. She um, had she had nine children that we were aware of. Uh, however, there are uh, there may have been a number of stillbirths and uh, that type of thing because the census would not count those children if they were stillbirths or they died within a month or two of being born. So she uh, nine children that lived through beyond the first year or so. Um, she had that, that's the, that's the family size now. She committed suicide by hanging in 1853. The reason why she did that, I'll give into, I'll talk about my interpretation of that. It's very, un, it's very unusual for a woman to commit suicide by hanging then and now. Um, and, um, and there may be reasons for that and other historians have commented on um, the life of women during that period of time. This is this period of time in mid 19th century America was not a, 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 a very easy time for anybody. It wasn't an easy time for children. It wasn't even e easy time for women. And, when, and of course, when the Civil War came, it certainly wasn't an easy time for the men uh, of, of that generation. She's buried at Mount Zion um, Cemetery. Uh, and she, uh, with her husband, here's Mount, here's Mount Zion Cemetery. They also call it Hall Cemetery. This is in Frederick County. It's actually in Ladysburg in Frederick County. And there is the, uh, here is the marker for both uh, Elizabeth and George Marion, the parents of Margaret Marion. This, uh, this part of the cemetery is the old part of the cemetery. So it, in my opinion, this obviously is a plaque that was, uh, a monument, I'm sorry, that was created long after their death uh, that the Marion children decided to uh, put in its uh, place of an older one. The, uh, you'll see as we go through this, the Marion children uh, were well off. Uh, they, they, had, uh, they, they had money that they either inherited or through Frederick uh, marrying the older brother, one of the brothers, uh, made through his fertilizer plant. Well, the, the, the reasons, why, why would she have killed herself? And like I said, the, these are, these are uh, interpretations. Um, the giving giving birth that and during that time period was was not a pleasant uh, thing to do um, for a number of reasons. The the doctors, if you call them doctors, were a lot of times more like butchers. Uh, uh, they didn't have the training. They also uh, were not very respectful of women at that point, and they thought they knew everything. Um, so that made it difficult. Also. Uh, Going to a hospital back then, it was, it was more likely you would um, die at a hospital a lot of times than if you stayed at home and gave birth because the hospitals uh, were not uh, very sanitary. This is before they knew what germs were. So they put a bunch of people in a place uh, where they don't know what germs are, and then the other, the more people die when you, when you uh, have them all go in the same uh, location. Um, and this, this was this, you know, this is similar to the, um, when the, uh, potato famine in Ireland took place, they, they, all these people would congregate in one place and the, most of them died from disease 
because of that, and because they didn't know what germs were back then. Um, they also, the, the postpartum issue about this, if you can imagine, and I can't imagine this, but if you can imagine having nine, 10, 12 children over uh, you know, every year and a half to two years, um, you can imagine the, the, that that causes physical problems in a, in a woman um, and also causes uh, emotional problems. Um, now, back then, they didn't know what that was, but it, it, there, there is uh, evidence that a number of women became mentally ill because of that, um, and uh, some of them would commit suicide because of that. Also, like I said, it also caused lifelong physical and mental problems. It wasn't just a temporary uh, thing. Uh, and also, you can imagine Elizabeth Marion, uh, she lost uh, four children before the Civil War took place. Two of those deaths occurred within one month of each other in 1852. And I'm going to get to the children and, and talk about children in a minute also. George Marion was a very successful uh, man. He, he, um, he owned a grist mill, and he uh, was a, was a uh, leader in, at the Trinity Eva Evangelical Lutheran Church in Tawnytown. And like I said, he, he made a good amount of money. Um, uh, doing the, uh, operating the grist mill. He actually had an assistant uh, uh, help him out, and the census records indicate that, uh, that the farm itself is worth thousands and thousands of dollars, which was a lot of money back then. Um, after, uh, after the death of his wife, and it may have been because of the death of his wife, they moved their church membership from the Trinity Evangelical Church in Ta Tawnytown to Woodsboro Church in Frederick County, And that's, that's a picture of the uh, Woodsboro Church in, uh, in Frederick County. Um, they were there for a very short period of time. And then, I'm sorry, that's, uh, that's the Trinity Church. And that's the Trinity Parsonage. And those are uh, some older photographs of the Trinity Church. Uh, there's no photograph of the Trinity Church actually during the Civil War. The closest one to it is the one that was from 1871. Uh, but around, that's the Woodsboro Church. So in 1855, he moved the, the church, his church membership, to this church. They weren't there very long. Um, also, it was the time that they moved from Tawnytown to Bruceville. And Bruceville uh, was where the family lived um, for the rest of the life of Margaret Marion and, her, and Joanna Marion and uh, Frederick Marion. That's an old picture of the Woodsboro Church. Now the children, as I said, four of them died at a very young age, and I, the, na the names are on here, Susanna, Elizabeth, Julia, and, Mar and uh, Mary Mary. And all these, all these um, they're all buried at uh, Mount Zion uh, Cemetery. And all these are, uh, all these, you can't see it from the, but all these, uh, uh, plots or right next to the parents' plots, the younger children. Now, uh, children died at high rates back then of, of two causes for the most part, um, both disease, either disease or accidental causes. And this, um, this affected all strata of society, whether you were wealthy or uh, very poor. Um, two famous deaths during that time period is uh, it was Willie Lincoln, who was uh, Abraham Lincoln's son, who died of typhoid, and Jefferson Davis's son, who died of falling off a banister, hitting the, the brick cement, and dying of accidental causes. So it just didn't affect those who were not uh, wealthy and um, uh, ups uh, had money and, and power. It affected everybody. Uh, they also the third the other part too was there there was uh, abuse by the fathers back then. Not all fathers, but certain fathers. And a, a great deal was due to the binge drinking that went on back during this time period in the uh, mid 19th century. This is a time period when fathers start, uh, men start doing work outside the home. So they would go, they would go to, you know, it was the start of, the, of not the second industrial revolution, which occurred after the Civil War, but it was, the country is becoming more industrial. Fathers would be going to places to work other than on farms. Um, their meeting place started to be these saloons that started popping up, and they started to binge drink, at least some of them. I'm going to say they all did that. 
this quote that's on here is, is, from, uh, is from Margaret Marion herself in the book that she wrote, 77 Days uh, Abroad, uh, where she indicates, uh, where she uh, makes a statement that there were many dozens of little uh, cripples, some made so by drunken fathers, and it was so sad to think none of them could ever walk again. And that's something she actually wrote herself. So you can imagine that's, that statement uh, must have been from some, uh, maybe not personal knowledge from her own father being uh, an intemperate person, but maybe her friends had been, something she had experienced probably in her lifetime. Uh, now, the, the supposition is that most of these children, the young children, died of disease, especially two of them that died within one month of each other. There, there were a number of ep epidemics that ran through the cities and towns during that time period. Um, so more than likely, uh, at least the two children who died within one month of each other were died from disease. I'm not gonna go through all these, all these figures, but you can see a high rate of deaths occurred during this time period. And these high rates of death would remain uh, basically those same rates of death until the early 20th century, um, until, until hospitals actually became uh, places that to be healed and not to actually die in the hospitals from the, from the various diseases. You can imagine how high rates, these rates are extremely high, uh, and it's, uh, it's just part of living during that time period. And I, I have the, the rates for Maryland also. They, they were extremely high in Maryland, too. Um, now, the other siblings. Uh, Joanne, or Joan, or her name is various ways is spelled throughout the records, uh, was one of the three, uh, two um, siblings that Margaret lived with all of their lives together uh, at that house in Bruceville. And I'll show it to, to you soon. Um, and Joanne was, uh, died in 1906, and there's not much on her. There's a lot of census records indicating that she was living with both Margaret and Frederick, her brother. Um, but other than that, I don't know much about Joanna. I, as I said, there may be other information out there, but I'm, I'm unaware of it. William Marshall marrying. Uh, there is more information on William Marshall. Uh, he died a fairly young man. He's also buried in uh, Mount Zion Church, Mount Zion Cemetery. Um, and it has some information where he went to school, about his children, about he also uh, uh, had some, $15,000 was a lot of money back then. So um, that he was wealthy also, well to do. Uh, he is though, it's, it's, to me it's a little, it's a little uh, strange that the, his marker, which is, that's the marker, uh, it's, it's separated from everybody else's, and it, it's not together with, with the other, um, with Frederick or, uh, or Joanna or, or, or Margaret herself. Now, Frederick was the older brother. He, he was the one that had a fertilizer plant in, uh, in Kimar, and a uh, very successful fertilizer plant. He made a lot of money off that, uh, and he, um, he actually said he lived with his sister and Joanne or Joanna uh, most of their adult life. Luther marrying, uh, we know very little about Luther other than what's on here, but Luther uh, outlived all his siblings. He moved to Indiana at some point. He's the only marrying that's not buried in, in Hall Cemetery. Uh, I don't know what happened to him after he uh, left and went to Indiana, um, but he, he was the survivor of all the siblings because in the obituaries it indicates he's a survivor. But that's, that's the only thing I know about him and there's information about uh, his working on the farm uh, when he was younger. And then there's Maggie, the reason we're here for today. Um, of course her, her, uh, her, her uh, birth name, bapt uh, baptismal name was Margaret, but she went by the name Maggie. Uh, and there's, there's a couple things, like I said, she kept a diary for those who do not know that. She kept a diary not of the Civil War movements, uh, while she was at Clevis' school for girls in New Windsor. But you know, the usual information that a 16-year-old girl would keep about her friends and about she, was, uh, she didn't like the fact that her brother Fred would tell her what to do uh, because Fred actually w was basically her, one of her parents and Joanna was the other, but she would cringe sometimes that she couldn't do what she wanted to do. And there's things in a diary about her having ice cream and um, that type of thing. But there's also, which no child this age would ever do today, walk 10 miles to go to church. I mean, kids, kids today wouldn't walk 
two miles to go anywhere. Um, but <laughs> but it, it's that type of thing. It's in a diary. The diary's 50 some pages long. The um, reason we're going to hear today, though, is I'll discuss what she said about the war as it came through uh, Carroll County. She, as an adult, we're talking about this too. She became a leader in the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Uh, that was a large movement back then. Uh, and it, part, of that, part of the temperance part of that also was a suffrage movement back then because, of course, women did not have the right to vote during that time period. Uh, she, the book I already mentioned that she wrote, and she died uh, in October two, 1923. Those are the monuments uh, for Frederick, uh, Margaret, and Joanne. And once again, they're in the Hall Cemetery. Now, that Civil War. As we know, uh, Maryland was one of four uh, border states during that time period. And, as re as, and because of that, there was a great deal of conflict within Maryland between those who supported the South and those who supported the North. And also there was conflict within Carroll County uh, for those that owned slaves and those that did not own slaves, um, and those that were sympathetic to the South and those sympathetic to the North. So obviously this, this would cause children at that point to take sides as their parents took sides. It was impossible not to be politicized during this time period um, when you had a war coming through your town and right down the street, basically in Gettysburg. This is uh, information about slavery back then and uh, the numbers of slaves that uh, were in, in the United States and in Carroll County and in um, information I uh, obtained concerning Tawny Town and Carroll County. Carroll County had 783 slaves in 1860. Uh, and I'll show where that ranks in all the counties in the state. And Frederick County, uh, as you can see the numbers for that. The, the problem with, uh, not problem, the, the, the political issue concerning the uh, slave issue back then was also a political issue because the, slaves, the slave counties had a great deal of power over the uh, 1850 Constitutional Convention um, retaining slavery, which would not be abolished in Maryland until 1864. Here's just a, a general number about the number of slaves, and you can see and, and it was approximately 4 million in the United States and then Maryland's um, slave population. And here's the ranking. This is the percentage of slaves per total population of the county. And you can see that uh, Carroll County certainly was not at the top. They were toward the bottom of, of that list. Um, and the other ones, there, was, there were counties with almost 50 to 60 percent of slave population. And this is in 1860. And I just put one of the, one of the, um, one of the, um, ad, no, I won't call it an ad, but one of the um, documents that were in the Carroll County Times, Amer American Sentinel, uh, newspaper in 1860, and this, this, this particular one was repeated several times um, about uh, locating uh, someone who was a slave. And there were many of these. I only included the one. There, there, were, there were numerous ones in the newspapers back then, both in Carroll County and Frederick County. And the county was also divided in, in the soldiers were who they, on whose side they fought for. Uh, they were both Union soldiers and Confederate uh, uh, soldiers that came from Maryland. Um, there's a family history that was written in 1984, which is in the public uh, library about the Marings, and it did indicate that Frederick was uh, served in the Union Army. However, when I uh, researched this and uh, obtained a copy, what I thought was uh, the Frederick Maring, who was the brother of Maggie, from the, um, from the Soldiers and Sailors database, it wasn't him. It was some other Frederick Maring. Uh, because the age just didn't match up. So I, to, as far as I know, Frederick was not a soldier in the Civil War. This is talks about the elections just briefly. Uh, Lincoln was not a favorite of, the, of Carroll County uh, or of Maryland, as you can, uh, as you can clearly see. Um, he, you know, he won the national vote, um, but he certainly didn't uh, win the vote in Maryland. Oh, I just went backwards. You can see Carroll County, uh, he only received uh, uh, one vote from uh, New Windsor. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
He came, he, 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 for, the, uh, for Tony Town, he came in last with only seven votes. Um, so Lincoln was not a favorite in, in the state of Maryland, and probably why they had, um, they had cannons facing Baltimore during that time, and they were arresting the General Assembly um, during that period of time. Um, and then Frederick County, uh, similarly, he was not a favorite in Frederick County either. Now, Ma Ma Maggie's diary. One of her, f her first entry in her diary and one thing, let me, let me tell you, I wanted to go back a little bit um, about the, a lot of times the inaccuracies of some things that, that pop up and then are repeated over and over again. Um, for a long time, she was always thought to be 13 years old. Uh, even a professor that, uh, who wrote an article from the University of Maryland that I reviewed said she was 13 years old. Well, she was 16 at the time of the Gettysburg Battle. Uh, and I know that from all this, the census records and a number of other records. What apparently happened, uh, there was a typed paper on top of the diary from uh, one of the dealmans. I can't remember which dealman it was at the time. He indicated she was 13, but she wasn't. She was 16. And that's one of the problems with research. You have to uh, uh, check to make sure the records are accurate. And of course, some records are more accurate than others. So the census records and other records uh, clearly indicate she was 16. She was, mu she was much older than, um, uh, there's a big difference between a 13 and a 16 year old girl at that point. So uh, the first diary entry, she was concerned, she was concerned about the, the rebels coming into Maryland, um, as you can see. She, excuse me. Um, and you could also see from this, these first diary entries in June that she definitely was a unionist. Um, she was not a supporter of the uh, Confederates back then. And uh, it's obvious from these diary entries. And this is, uh, this is the building where the New Windsor, I'm sorry, the Cleveland School for Girls was in New Windsor. This obviously is the, the newer, uh, the recent picture of it, of uh, the photograph of it. You'll see a photograph in the, in the journal from the 19, I think it's 1915, that, that shows a an, an, uh, probably more accurate photograph of what the school looked like back then. And these further diary entries show that, that how politicized this 16-year-old girl, girl had become. She was not, um, she was mocking the Confederate Army. She was very critical of the Confederate Army um, and, and the rebels' positions in this. Um, and she's also very concerned. She's very concerned uh, that uh, the war's going, going on in her backyard. And I said, I'm not going to read through each of these. They're, they're in the journal. And, and, um, but it's, it's very obvious what her concerns are. She's also very concerned that she hears rumors of the Confederates actually coming through the towns that she visits, like New, like Tawny Town, where, where, where her baptismal church was, and she would visit Tawny Town and visit that church during the time she was at Cleveland School for Girls, and also, uh, of course, New Windsor, where she was. Um, these rumors would go through, you know, be, be go through the uh, rumor mill, and some of the times, sometimes they were wrong, sometimes they were uh, right, and most of the time they were wrong, that the soldiers, Confederate, not coming through New Windsor. As a matter of fact, during the Battle of Gettysburg, Confederate soldiers did not come through New Windsor unless they were, uh, be, they, unless they were being held in, uh, and imprisoned by uh, the, the Union soldiers. She does, at, at one point, uh, like I said, being a 16-year-old girl, she was, in, she was impressed by, by how well-dressed the Union soldiers uh, cavalry was as it was coming through uh, New Windsor. Um, and this is, this is General Gregg, who was the cavalry officer um, who chased uh, you know, Jeb Stewart all the way through to Gettysburg. Um, and he, he was a, uh, the cavalry officer that was coming through Maryland during that time period. Um, just as an aside, General Gregg unfortunately um, retired, dropped, not dropped out. He he ended his um, ended his participation in the war pretty early um, after the Battle of Gettysburg. And reading about him, it's obvious that he would have what they would call today post traumatic stress syndrome. He just he he just couldn't take uh, the battles anymore, um, and he did actually retire at some point. And he tried to come back later on. Um, and I don't think he was met with much success when he did after the war was over. And there's General Gregg. Uh, he 
if you can see, if you see her diary for a 16-year-old girl, she was w very well educated, and she wrote a number of these uh, diary entries are poetic, uh, how she writes them. Um, and this is one is somewhat poetic, how she wrote this, and she becomes more poetic when she talks about uh, a burial that I'll show to you in a few minutes. Um, the spellings in here are her spellings, not because I can't spell Virginia. Uh, <laughs> so, um, th th these are, because back then there was no there was no standard spelling back then for the most part. Um, matter of fact, I don't think it was standard spelling until the 21st century, early 21st century. She talks about the, uh, and I'm going to show you this um, if uh, if I can show show you the. Uh, relationship between Cleveland School for Girls, the Presbyterian Church, and uh, also the, where, the, where the cemetery is in pre and at the Presbyterian Church, and also Dealman Inn. But the school and the Presbyterian Church uh, uh, were next to each other. They touched each other. The cemetery was right outside the school itself. So you can imagine she was right there when she saw these uh, events going on. Um, the soldiers from Greg's uh, cavalry would sleep both at the, um, on the grounds of the Presbyterian Church and also uh, Dealman Inn. It was known as, um, it wasn't known as Dealman Inn at the time, but it, uh, the, the building that's now, was now known as Dealman Inn. And like I said, she talks about the, her and her girlfriends at the, at the school just waiting for these soldiers to come through. Um, at, at this point, it still was more of, uh, of the amazement of young teenage girls wanting to see well-dressed soldiers coming through town. Now this, this is the church, I mean, if, for those who don't know, this is the church in New Windsor, the Presbyterian Church, and the, and the cemetery is, is to, to uh, the left of the photograph. And um, that's, that's the Ullman Inn. What I'm going to try to do here is this is going to show like a street view. There we go. This is on the corner. The, the church is on this corner of High Street and Church Street. High Street is also known as Route 31 in, in New, New Windsor. I'm going to see if I can get this to... Uh, Oh, there we go, 301. It, it shows a relationship of the, the church, as it says, right next to the Cleavers School, and then across the street on a caddy corner to 31 is Dealman Inn. So all these buildings are within clearly eye view uh, of what's going on. So when, she, when Maggie talks about, when Maggie talks about seeing these things, she was, all, she was actually looking out her window actually seeing these things. Um, she also talked about uh, seeing Confederate soldiers. As I said, they only came in through town if they were actually imprisoned or uh, in, in, um, in, uh, by Union soldiers. So these, this, is a, this is a comment that she saw three rebel so soldiers come through town um, from, and, uh, no, I'm sorry, three re rebel so soldiers come through town with the, where, and the Union had captured them. This next thing on July 2nd, this is, she's commenting on as to the famous Corbett's Charge in Westminster, um, where, as most people know, is that the Jeb Stewart's uh, advance guard of 4,000 men were coming down, uh, were coming on, entering Main Street in Westminster, uh, very near to this building, uh, when the first Delaware uh, of 95 to 100 men uh, were there to guard uh, what they thought would the railroad and that type of thing. They, they were not there to uh, meet 4,000 of Jeb Stewart's hardened troops. Uh, and in charge of this, uh, of the first Delaware, Delaware was a major Napoleon Bonaparte Knight. Unfortunately, he didn't live up to his name uh, because he was he was in a bar drunk uh, during the time that Jeb Stuart's men uh, entered the town, and he very bravely uh, uh, commanded uh, Captain Corbett to charge. 
uh, the, the troops from Jeb Stewart. It was, he was brave about it because he stayed in the bar uh, <laughs> and, and was not in danger. Um, and the story is that uh, Captain Corbett, who, who was both young and apparently extremely brave, went ahead and did that. Um, and at one point, fortunately, his horse reared. And when the shot came toward him, it, it killed the horse and not him. But then he, he actually, uh, at that point, uh, with the horse uh, on the ground, he actually pulled out his pistol <laughs> and aimed it toward the um, oncoming Confederates. Fortunate for Captain Corbett, he was uh, captured before they shot him. Um, so, it, it, once again, he was a very brave man, and, and uh, Major uh, Napoleon Bonaparte Knight uh, just stayed in the bar. So, um, the one of the things, oh, oh, we'll go back. One of the things that Maggie commented on, and uh, it's, it, to us, it's be, to me, it's beyond unbelievable, is that she could hear the cannon fire from Gettysburg. There were approximately, and it, was, it varies, probably about 600 cannon up, during the, during, up there during the battle uh, total on, from both sides. Um, and for those who know this from a scientific thing, point of view, this is something called acoustic echo. There, sometimes you could hear very clearly here, but you could be a, hundred, a couple hundred yards away from it or half a mile away from it, you couldn't hear the hear the cannon fire at all. I mean, there's stories that people heard all the way up into um, Philadelphia uh, and even further than that. But she, but she heard cannon fire uh, during this time period. And, and obviously, it was a concern of hers. And oh, it should be louder than that. <laughs> One second. It sounds better when it's louder than that. But. Um, <laughs> I just like that. I just like that icon that it uh, be, because it it, uh, it shows that she, what she was hearing over and over again of this cannon fire. She also was, uh, like I said, the, the, that whole joy about seeing the Union soldiers coming into town all dressed in their uh, regalia uh, kind of disappeared for her when she realized that these people were soldiers were dying on the field. And that's what the, one of these, this remark indicates about how, how bad it must be for the soldiers up there in Gettysburg. Um, and she, she was able to witness the uh, burial of two sur of soldiers while she was there too in the Presbyterian graveyard, uh, one of them being Thomas Thorne. Um, and I said, she's very poetic uh, in how, how she writes this uh, when she indicates, this is but a bright picture compared to those who are shot on the battlefield. And then she, um, Follow that with a when will the cruel war be over? And this is in the journal that this was from, uh, from a song of that time period. And there's the Presbyterian battle, I mean Presbyterian battle, there's a the Presbyterian graveyard cemetery. I looked through there, I couldn't find the, 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 any marker for uh, uh, Mr. Thorne, but uh, I'm sh I know it's there, I just couldn't find it the day I was there. Um, she also, this, the, the thing other, about, other thing about diaries too, she was just wrong about some of the things she wrote uh, in the diary because it was based on rumors sometimes, it was based on information from uh, other persons, it was based from newspaper accounts which were just wrong at the time. She said she was saddened by the, uh, by the deaths, uh, by the brave soldiers killed and wounded on Friday and Saturday. Um, she, she said that General Sedgwick and General uh, Sickles were both killed, well that's not true. Um, General Sedgwick lived until, I think, in his 90s. General Sickles did lose his leg, I believe, but uh, he didn't die um, either. And General Gregg, as far as I know, General Gregg was never wounded. So, um, so that's, that shows the inaccuracies of, of, of her parts of her diary, too. Um, I don't know if I've got to, but they also say that the, she also indicated in the, the Corbett's Charge diary entry that the, uh, that the rebels skedaddled out of town. Well, the rebels didn't skedaddle out of town. The rebels took over the town for a short period of time. Um, but once again, that shows her position that she so, so in support of the Union that, uh, that she would make that statement. And uh, in the latter parts of, of uh, in, in early July, in the latter parts of July, she, she indicates the, uh, the aftermath of this, the casualties uh, that occur as a result of this. And she uh, mentions the whole, uh, whole uh, aspect of that the churches were taken over for hospitals uh, after the Battle of Gettysburg. I believe there were 4,000 soldiers 
um, that were treated in the Frederick Carroll County uh, area uh, in various churches. Uh, then she also mentions the whole idea of when this is Mrs. Cleavish, the head of the school of Cleavish, the school for girls, and Mrs. Maggie Ecker, they were collecting food and clothing for the wounded soldiers. And then this next diary entry indicates the, uh, the aftermath of the battle and how many soldiers died and, and were wounded. The entry, I put the July 6th entry in here because there, there, was, there was some question wh whether she was living in Bruceville at the time of this uh, of the war, um, although that's rather clear at this point, but it shows that her concern about soldiers passing through Bruceville, and she would be concerned because that's where she lived. Uh, she this just talks once again about the what I call the retreat and the chase. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't much of a chase because uh, in the long line of incompetent Union generals. Um, me just loud the, the, the southern uh, army, the Confederate army, with their back to the Potomac uh, River to just uh, sit there for days while they were building bridges to cross the Potomac River. Um, and of course this was not something that Lincoln appreciated very much because he relieved them of duty not too long after that. Um, so that she comments about that um, and, and in another email, another, another um, diary entry, um, I'll show how she really is not happy about that. Also, she comments about her church again, the Trinity, uh, Ch Trinity Church, which was used as a signal tower uh, during the war, during that period of time during the battle. Um, and I, I just put that in there just so you can see the connection between her church and the war itself. And this is where on July 21st, she. Uh, really chastises the, uh, the Union uh, Army for allowing, once again, as they did at the Battle of Antietam, uh, to allow the troops to, uh, the, the, allow the Confederates to cross into the Potomac and survive uh, for another day. And I just put this in here for the, uh, p most, most people know about the deaths here. Uh, the, most of the deaths is, uh, are, were from disease, not from uh, actual shells or being shot. Uh, but from disease itself. And what most people don't know is that 50,000 Southern civilians died as a result of this war, and most of that was from disease um, and malnutrition. Next thing, I don't see what time I have. Oh, it's 10 01 already. Um, <laughs> so let me, let me just go through uh, some of this. The, the connection with the religion. Uh, of the time and uh, how women were treated and, and were expected to be at the time was that the religion at the time uh, made it clear that women were supposed to be the uh, caretakers of, of the children. No longer was it the father and the mother to the same equal extent, because now remember the fathers are out uh, working outside the home, so the mothers were expected to be uh, the caregivers. And they also were uh, expected to be the moral compass for the, the raising of, the children, of their children. And the reason why, why uh, this, is, this is important is because it was the backbone of all these reform movements back then, because it was expected that since the women had to protect the home, that they were responsible for protecting their children from, a lot of times, from the fathers um, who were not considered moral they were, they were because of that, the drinking and their uh, other activities at these taverns, including prostitution, that they were not the ones that were supposed to be raising the children at the time. And as a result, um, the religious background from the Protestant, it's mostly a Protestant movement, was that uh, the women were supposed to help in a public way to protect their ch children uh, of the homes. So that this, the, the the beginning of, of the temperance movement was all religiously based, and it was for the most part based um, in, in rural areas um, against the urban areas. And, that, and the reason for that is the new, the new immigration coming in during that time period in the um, late 20th century, early 21st century, uh, were not Protestant-based uh, immigration. It was mostly um, uh, Catholics coming in from Italy and from other, other uh, places in Europe. And uh, although the Presbyterians that supported uh, temperance were uh, obviously not drinkers, they didn't th they drinker drinking was a sinful thing, 
um, that was not, uh, at least through their perception, was not how, how the uh, Catholic population uh, uh, was in support of that. These are just some of the reform movements back then, um, and I won't go through all of them, but the, the two that were for today are the suffrage movement and temperance movement, but these, these are all women-led women -led reform movements. And, I, there, there, and I'm gonna skip this There's a, uh, because of the time, time restraints we have, but, there, uh, but I will talk about prohibition. Prohibition uh, in Maryland started, or in Carroll County started as early in the 1820s, 1830s, and it had fits and starts over time, but it wasn't until the Women's Christian Temperance Union uh, was created in 1874 that uh, there was a realization that they had to tie temperance with suffrage because without the, without the right to vote, they would never be able to get prohibition uh, on a constitutional level. So, that's, uh, so that was one of the uh, brilliant things that the WCTU did. They realized they had to connect the two in order to uh, get prohibition passed. So um, Ma Maggie never married, and neither did Joanne Mary ever marry. Uh, and that was very unusual in post-Civil War America because in post-Civil War America, for obvious reasons, all the men came back from war, marriages increased dramatically, uh, but neither Joanne nor, uh, like I said, nor Maggie ever married. Of course, Fred never married either. Frederick Mary never married all, either. Um, and the reason, the importance of that is a couple of reasons. Number one, um, she might not have married because she saw the difficulty her mother had. Obviously, her mother had difficulty. Her mother committed suicide. Um, secondly, the, the, death of, the death of her siblings uh, may have been a re reason for not wanting to get married. And, and lastly, the, it, it was typical for uh, a number of women in these reform movements not to be married at the time. To de they were dedicating their lives toward the movements. So all those, all those issues come into to play into why Maggie would have uh, become a leader in the uh, Women's Christian Temperance Union. Now, uh, what's interesting, when she wrote a book about 77 days abroad in 1910, she used Lincoln um, both, as I said, at, because she respected Lincoln um, for two, two different uh, reasons. She quotes, a, uh, she quotes in her book um, her seeing a picture of Statue of Lincoln when she was in Europe and that how she was so impressed by it and she still was heartbroken by his death um, during the war. And she also comments um, about the connection of Lincoln to the temperance, uh, temperance movement. It is true that Abraham Lincoln did give speeches um, as a, uh, that he was against uh, drink and he supported temperance. And the WCTU would use Lincoln as a supporter of temperance long, be long after his death. Um, now, it's a, I think it's a little too much positive thinking when she put in her book, of 77 Days Abroad, that uh, right after the war, if Lincoln would have lived, his first priority would have been uh, prohibition. There was a little problem of, uh, you know, <laughs> of, of the South and uh, sending federal soldiers down there and uh, reconstruction. So I doubt that would have been on Lincoln's mind, um, but it certainly was uh, Maggie's uh, position on it. The WCTU was the largest uh, women's uh, reform movement during this period of time, and you can see how, how the membership increased dramatically. So during the time that Maggie was involved in this, it was a growing organization, and it was, the, uh, like I said, the largest numerically. And um, it was it was an organization that allowed women to be leaders, and that was uh, until, until the late 1890s, early 1900s, a number of, of Lutheran, evangelical Lutheran churches did not allow women to public, do public speaking or to hold public uh, positions, hold positions of leadership in the uh, Lutheran church, including her own bat baptismal church, uh, Trinity Lutheran Evangelical Church. And the reason I bring that up is because there's a gap between her diary of 1863 and the next time that we see any kind of writing of hers at all or any type of indication she's doing anything to 1885. There are census records 
but uh, not until 1885 did we see her participating um, in, um, in the Women's Christian Temperance Union. And either that's because the records, she participated, but we don't have records, or it's because she was so religiously based into her church that she had to wait until the church allowed her to become uh, a, a leader in the Christian's Temperance Union. And, and how, these, how these worked is that these were connected to churches, and she was the president of her, uh, of the, of her particular union, Christian Temperance Union group, at uh, Zion uh, Church, where the where the where the uh, graveyard is, where the cemetery is, so she needed that support of the church. So she she was a delegate to a number of national conventions. These are the ones I'm able to uh, find from the microfilm, um, in all in these years, and and she believed very strongly that the 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 um, suffrage and temperance were connected. Nineteen oh six was when Mount Zion, and this goes to my earlier point, Mount Zion allowed the uh, union to begin in Mount Zion Church. And she was the president from nineteen oh six to nineteen twenty two. And uh, like I said, she only died a year after that. And she had uh, held other uh, positions too. This is her book that she read. I uh, read, I'm sorry. It's a book. She may have read her book also. But this is a book that she wrote in uh, with her trip to Europe in 1910, where she spent 77 days there, she was going to the international conference of the WCTU in Scotland. Um, and this is the book that she read. Obviously, as I said, um, she had money uh, to be able to do this. And whether it came from Fred, who, appear who apparently was very generous um, uh, in, in his, the money he had to give to his sister, because his sister never married, she didn't make any money on her own to my, to my knowledge. Uh, or it's, it came from the uh, came from the father or both. That's just a, the other photo, other picture in the book. This is this is a photograph. The only photograph that I'm aware of that shows um, Margaret Mary. This is the photograph that's actually in the book, 77 Days Abroad. The actual photograph itself is attached to the book, which is at the Maryland Historical Society. It's not a copy. It's actually the photograph itself. I'm not sure. Which one of these women is Margaret Mary? We have some family members here today who, who believe that it's the woman in front of the photograph. If I were a betting man, I would say it's the woman in front because it's her book. So you would think she'd be the one in front uh, also. Um, it's a little funny, though, too. This is during the Victorian period, around the Victorian period, and she doesn't have any shoes on. She's barefooted in the grass there. So uh, if, you, if you can see that. Um, I mean, back then, they're probably scandalous. Um, now they're both wearing white, and, and it also may be because that the the um, Women Christian Temperance Union they call themselves the White Ribbon Society, also the uh, purity. I don't know if these dresses are part of the WCTU uh, uniform or dress, or they just both happen to have white dresses on that day. I don't know who the other woman is. She does comment in her book that she had a best gal, so she had a friend. Obviously, it's not her sister because her sister died uh, four years before the book was written. Her sister died in 1906. Uh, that was her only surviving sister, uh, too. So my guess is it's a friend of hers. It may, and, may, and since it was part of the book and where she mentions her best friend, it, it probably is her best friend. Um, the, these are quotes from uh, uh, Maggie in her uh, book of 77 Days. As I said, I'm not going to go through each one of them. but. Um, it just talks. It, it just talks about uh, the reason for suffrage, the need for women to be treated right because they've been mistreated over the time. Over time. Now, the, you know, Maggie Marion was a real person. So, uh, and and you have to make your own conclusions about uh, people of that time had different ways of looking at things than we do now. Um, I mean, I think uh, I, I'm very, uh, one of my, I guess who will call him heroes is Teddy Roosevelt. I thought he was a very great president. I thought he was very decisive, but he said things then that if he said now, he'd be thrown out of office, uh, unless he was running for election in New York uh, City. Uh, but, um, 
but she, this movement, this, this movement of uh, reform uh, of the WCTU and a, a lot of these wo woman-led movements back then, there was a certain tinge of uh, anti-Catholicism to it because they were afraid the Pope was, uh, was a leader that was, take, was actually causing people in the America to do things they, they were, there's, that were against the American way. So there was that part of, that was that part of, uh, of this movement back then. And, and she's very critical of, of the Catholic Church and um, of my ancestors, too. So when she talks about the, the Italians in here. This is, her, this, is her, this is her house where she lived, 1340 Bruceville Road. And it's right off of 194. And if you make a turn on the Bruceville and go to the very end of the road, um, uh, that's, that's the house. Uh, now it's obviously a recent picture because it has a radar dish on top of it. Um, this is the house. I, I actually, I, and I'm not going to try this again, but if you go on the Google Maps, you can actually get a street view picture and you actually follow the, 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 this little road all the way down to the end and you'll see the, uh, how the house currently looks now. Um, uh, but I'm not going to try that again. Oop, I'll go back to that. We have time for questions or comments or anything anybody wants to talk about. She's buried in Hall Cemetery. Halls, H -U -A, it's, Mount, it's Mount Zion uh, Church. And Mount Zion Church is in uh, Ladysburg, uh, right in Frederick County. Halls Church. It's, it's, um, it's, I, but it's spelled H-A-U-G-S. Yeah. I, I, I believe you. <laughs> it's also off of Halls Road, or Halls Road. But it's, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's surrounded by cornfields. It's probably the same way it looked years ago. Yes, ma'am. No, I, you know, I don't. I was asked that before. I, I was talking to some of the family members. I don't know exactly where that is or was, I should say. The, the question was, uh, George Marion had a gristmill. Do I know where that's located? I indicated no, I do not. Any other? Oh, yes, ma'am. The, the, school, the school and the, and the church are right next to one another. There's, there's, there's the school, there is the cemetery of the church and the building of, the, of uh, it's within, I mean, it's within 30 feet. I mean, it's, it's, real, it's really close, I mean, they're right next to each other. And then Dealman Inn is, is a little further down uh, on Main Street and, and High Street on, on that caddy corner. Yes, ma'am, yes, sir. Could you repeat the question so we Oh, I'm sorry. The question was where the relationship of the school was to the church. Uh, Presbyterian Church in New Windsor. Anyone else have any questions? Oh, yes, ma'am. My understanding that the diary has a documentation of troops going through New Windsor. She documents the thousands of troops that march past the school, and she recounts what song they're singing. I didn't see that in the diary. The diary of, of the Confederate soldiers. Although General Craig's General Craig's cavalry did march did march through uh, Yes. That's correct. Yeah, so they, they marched right by right by that house. I mean, it was a school. Yes, ma'am. Did you come across the milking machine invention by Mary? I'm sorry to hear that. Did you come across the milking machine invention by Mary? The question is, did I come across any information about a milking machine by, by Mary? No, I did not. I understand that there is some information about, about that. So the, the, the family, there's some family members here that said there, there was a milking machine. They have photographs of it. That's great. Yes, sir. Ah, oh, that's true. They could have, yeah, they could have been saying that. <laughs> Any other questions or comments or well thank you for coming today. Well we want to th thank Sam for uh, his, his great presentation today and, and thanks for all the Marings who came out, uh, the family members. Uh, why don't you all kind of stay here for a few minutes?
And uh, you know, we can maybe get a photograph of some of you, and uh, maybe with Sam, and that would be a good thing to put in the, a future edition of The Courier, perhaps, or on our new website coming in September. I uh, want to thank also, the uh, again, the program committee for, an outstanding, for its outstanding support, New Windsor State Bank, and a special thank you to my colleague uh, uh, at, at the uh, office, uh, um, yes, Kathy, Kathy Beatty. Kathy, where are you? I know you're still here somewhere. There she is. We'll see you next month.